Psalm 25, 1 through 7. To thee I lift my soul, O Lord, I trust in thee. My God, let me not be ashamed, nor foes triumph for me. Let none that wait on thee be put to shame at all, but those that without cause transgress, let shame upon them fall. Psalm 25, 1 through 7.
come to prayer this morning, let us remember the whole family, Anne who laid her mother to rest in the past week. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence this morning, on this the Sabbath day, the day, Lord, that thou declared to be a holy day, and that all men should be should honour it. And yet, O oh Father, we come with a confession that thy day has not been offered, honoured. And therefore, Lord, we ask that through the Lord Jesus Christ, if we have been at fault in this, the breaking of thy commandments, we pray, Lord, that thou would have mercy upon us and that thou would deceive us through the Lord Jesus Christ and the cleansing of his blood. So, Heavenly Father, we come this morning with the petitions of our hearts to lay before thee. And we come thee asking thee, Lord, for a blessing upon this, the Sabbath day, as we join one with another to sing thy praises, to gather round thy word and hear, the, and hear it explained. Father, we pray that thine Holy Spirit shall be in all, and he shall be our teacher and guide this morning, that he shall take us through the pages of Scripture, and he shall be our interpreter in all things. Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks that as we gather, we can gather freely in our nation, and we can open thy word freely, and, Lord, we can proclaim from it. Heavenly Father, we remember those nations at this present time who are forbidden thy word. And we pray, Lord, that thou would open up those lands, open them up, O Lord, to the freedom of the gospel, so that all men can learn of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom thou didst send from thy glory down into this earth to be born of the woman who grew up as a tender plant, who, O oh Father, became at the age of thirty thy son that he gave unto thee all that thou commanded him. And, Father, in all that he gave, he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We thank thee, Father, for his example, how he showed love and care and tenderness even to his enemies, even, O oh Father, those who would spit in his face and taunt him. O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee through the shedding of his blood that we too can receive remission of sin, that we can be cleansed from all our unrighteousness. And we pray, Father, that that righteousness of Christ shall extend out among the nation, that men and women shall desire to come under the saving sound of the gospel. O oh, Heavenly Father, we do pray for that freedom. We pray for a time of great revival throughout our nation. We pray, Lord, that this land again become a land of faithfulness, a land, O oh Lord, that will flow with that milk and honey of Christ's grace, of his love and of his forgiveness. O oh, Heavenly Father, we do pray for all of our ministers. We remember our own minister this morning at cross. Father, as he prepares to call the faithful to the table this morning, and as he prepares to break bread and offer it unto them and the wine to them also, Lord, that they may have examined their hearts fully and they may know that they sit before Christ, the risen Lord, that these are not the body of Christ or the blood, but only symbols that represent the agony, the pain, and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for our minister this morning, Father, and the freedom of utterance that thou would give unto him at this time. And Father, we pray that he will know thy very presence in thy pulpit this hour. So, Father, we pray for all our ministers and all of our students. We pray, Lord, that thou would be with them. And we pray for those who are in mourning at this time, Father, even in our own congregation. 
We pray, Lord, thy hand be upon them and thy hand to guide and to lead them through these days that they may know the love of Christ and they may know that Christ says unto all men, come unto me and I will give you rest. May they know that calling at this time, O oh Father, and may we know also the love of Christ as we gather this morning to worship and to praise thee. We pray that thou would accept our worship and praise this morning in the love from which we have learned of Christ to offer unto thee that all things be done and said in accordance with thy will. We ask these things through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins for his sake. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture reading is found in Amos, the book of Amos. If you're using a church Bible, it's page 927 in the church Bible. Amos chapter 8. And the Lord has called Amos to go into the northern tribes, the ten tribes that went to the north of Israel. And these ten tribes have become somewhat distant from their promise and from the covenant. And the Lord has called on Amos to go into them. His name actually means burden or burden bearer. And so he was given the burden to go into the children of Israel in the north, northern lands. And the Lord calls him in this chapter and says unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, showed unto me a basket, behold, a basket of summer fruits. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruits. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the songs of the temple shall be howling in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place, and they shall cast them forth with silence. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and that Sabbath, that we may set forth what wheat, making the epath small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balance by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuge of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by his excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? And it shall rise up wholly as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned, by the flood of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day, and I will turn your feet into mourning, and all your songs into lamentations, and will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and the baldness upon every head, and I will make it as a mourning of the only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Behold, the day cometh, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, nor a famine of bread, nor a famine of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north and even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall their fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria, and say, Thy God, O deliver us, 
and the manna of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fail and never rise up again. And amen. May the Lord add a blessing to this reading of his word this morning. We again come to sing to the Lord in praise in Psalm 96, 96, 1 through 7. Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing all the earth to God. To God sing, bless his name, show still his saving health abroad. Among the heathen nations his glory do declare, and unto all the people show his works that wondrous are. 9 to 6, 1 through 7. Oh, Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Shall we come again to the New Testament? Scripture reading is found in the James's Epistle, chapter 5. James, chapter 5. That is in the Church Bible is 1, 2, 2, 1. James 5, and the Lord speaking to James, and James has given us this prophecy of the rich men and what will become. So as James reads through the Lord Jesus Christ, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your ministers that shall come up upon you. For your miseries that shall come up upon you, sorry. Your riches are corrupt and your garments are modern. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rust of them that shall be a witness against you. And you shall eat your flesh as if it were fire. You have heaped treasures together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the labour who hath reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth and the crieth of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruits of the earth, and have long patience for it until he receives the early and the later rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord, draweth nigh. Gird, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for example, of suffering, afflictions, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. You have seen the end of the Lord that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. It is Mary. Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayers of faith shall save the sick and the short Lord shall raise them up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one converts him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Amen. The Lord add a blessing to this reading also of his word. <coughs> Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Again, O Lord God, we enter into thy court. Again, we come through Jesus Christ. Father, we have read in thy portions of scriptures. We have read of the greed and the avarice of men. 
And Father, when we look around us today, we see that nothing has changed in this land. We see men are still hungry for silver and gold. They're still wanting and cheating. They're still going against thy word and thy commands that thou hast given unto us. So, Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that thine Holy Spirit open the passages of Scripture, that we may learn to live by thy word. We may learn to show unto others the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we have read that the prayers of a faithful man will convert. And we pray, Lord, for all who are faithful in prayer. We pray that they will know and see the fruits of their labours and that they will know the richness of the souls that are saved. So, Father, we pray this morning, wherever thy word is preached, that it preached with mighty power, that it preaches at Christ crucified, and that men shall hunger and thirst for thy word. So, Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that there be a time of blessing, that, Elias, these new rains shall come, there shall be a new crop, there shall be a new church. O oh, Father, we pray in thy word, be fulfilled in our ears and in our days, if it be according to thy will. But we pray earnestly, Father, that the cause of Christ be glorified and thy name be magnified amongst all men. We ask thee to hear our prayers, forgiveness of our sins again, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We come to sing in Psalm 14 this morning. We'll sing through this psalm, Psalm 14. That there is not a God the fool doth in his heart conclude. They are corrupt, their works are vile, not one of them doth good. Upon men's son the Lord for him did cast his eye abroad to see if any understood and did seek after God. 14, 1 through 7 to the end of the psalm. Yeah. 
if you'll gather when you're reading both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we'll see that the judgment is coming down on those of the rich and those who have shamed the people of God, especially those who were <clears throat> chosen of God in the Jewish faith. And we see how the, the Lord has sent both Amos to preach to them and to try and bring them back under the commandments and the covenant in which God made with them. And James also tells us of the greed of such men. But what's changed, we may ask, in the world? What has changed within our own realms today? Are not things just the same? Aren't there men and business of all sorts, people going around? The biggest fear we have today is when we pick up a paper or a, pick up a telephone or something, someone's trying to scam us out of our money. It's a big fear. And he sent to the northern tribes in Israel because the northern tribes had gone astray. They had, a, they had come under the influence of the Assyrians and they looked to the Assyrians for their wealth and for all their property. They wanted to be like them, have the same wealth and the same luxuries as the Assyrians seem to have. And I came at a great cost. The cost was to the poorer of society. The poor of society were robbed of their wealth, what little they had. And if they couldn't pay, they were taken and sold into slavery. And this is what happens when we disobey the word of God. And so when Amos gives us the account throughout his uh, um, prophecy, we see that Amos is not short in using terms, terms like a roaring lion, a lamb torn from the mouth of the lion, fat cows is what he describes these people as. And he describes the sin of the nation. And the Lord speaks to him here in chapter 8, in this 8th chapter. And we'll have a look at this now. The Lord, thus hath the Lord showed me, and behold, a basket of summer fruits. A basket of summer fruits. It looks nice, doesn't it? We see it all done up. All the fruits are polished and look at their best. And they look lovely there in a basket. And we think, what a lovely presentation to give to someone. And probably in our lives we have received or we have given a basket of fruit to such. But this basket of fruit is not what it seems. This basket of fruit is not even what the modern supermarkets would call ugly fruit. This has gone beyond the state of ugliness. Here the Lord is looking at the sin of the nation. And here he sees a basket of fruits that has gone sour, that has gone beyond human consumption. If you want to put it that way, to see how terrible this fruit really was. And the Lord said unto me, the end has come upon my people of Israel. That is what the Lord saw in that basket of fruit. The end of Israel. The end of a people whom the Lord had sworn to be their Lord and their, their God and them, his people. This was the Lord God who brought them out of slavery. Took them across the Red Sea and dry ground provided for them for 40 years in a desert, brought them up through many battles and wars, provided them with a king when they wanted one, gave them the great king in David and Solomon. The Lord is a Lord God who protected his people, gave them many victories 
over their enemies. But here he's declaring in great sadness, the end has come upon my people of Israel, on his people, the people whom God knew and chosen, the people who knew what it was to struggle. They knew the troubles and the trials of taking over the promised land. They knew what it was like to fight and take hold of land, to grow crops in that land. And here they have it. They have turned against the Lord their God. They've sought after the gods of their Syrians. They've gone after their, their wealth as they have seen it. And so they begin to mock them. And that word mock, I mean copy them, not to destroy them, but they copied them. And they said there in verse 5, when will the new moon be gone? They wanted the end of their feasts. They didn't want to be held by the church and the commandments. They wanted them gone, that we may sell corn, that they may gather and sell the corn at the end of the new moon. The harvest would be ripe. It'd be there for the collecting. It'd be there to be sold in its bushels. But no, they wanted it over. They didn't want the new moon. They wanted to work in regardless of it. And the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat. Oh, the epith of wheat. The 10% that they would give to the Lord. They didn't want that. They wanted it for themselves. And the shekel, great and falsifying the balance by deceit. When they went, the poor would harvest what they had. When they took it in to be weighed, the weights were false. One side was heavier than it should be. And the poor had to put more and more of their hard-earning farming on it to bring it up. They were being cheated. And it's like today. We are being cheated today. The false prophets that we have amongst our land are the false scales. They offer much at a great price. They offer much by defying the word of God, by bringing in false prophecies, taking away the commandments of God by deeds of law, by bringing in to the church those that God has outlawed and condemned. Yeah, there is falseness in the church today. There's a great imbalance in the gospel. Men have set forth their own stalls. They proclaim that what they had given to be the true gospel, just as these scales were being tampered with to bring forth wheat, to bring forth more and more from the poor for less and less gain. There was no money in it for the poorer. The money was taken by the wealthy. We see how they set forth that we may buy the poor for silver. When the poor couldn't pay the rent on their land, when they couldn't pay for the seeds that they bought to sow the land, and they were in debt, they bought them. They bought them for silver. And they needed for a pair of shoes. There was no thought of, we will share what we have. We have what we have and we want more, is the attitude in the northern tribes. That's why Amos was called 
And we said earlier, his name means a burden. And what a burden the Lord put on Amos to go into these ten tribes that had forsaken, had forsaken the Lord their God. They'd looked after themselves. They'd gathered unto themselves the wealth and they didn't share it. They didn't share it. We see how today gospel is being preached falsely. False prophets are offering false hope. Amos saw that. And that's why he turned to the manner in which he did. In chapter 2 and at verse 13, he called them a roaring lion, a lion that went about devouring whom it could. And again he tore about in lamb three, a lamb torn from the mouth of the lion, how the shepherd would fight for that lion, that lion to get the lamb back. Even it mean the lamb was torn away and the shepherd gained very little. He fought. And Amos knew that he had to fight. He had to fight against the avarice of the northern tribes. He had to fight to bring them into a recognition that they'd understood that they had failed the Lord their God, that they had turned away from the commandments of the Lord God. They had forgotten the Lord of the Sabbath. They had forgotten the Lord God who was unto them a mighty fortress in times past. And those have been after the great sums of money, fat swine, fat cows, fat pigs. That's how he was describing. And is it not like the churches today? We want to fill our churches with people, so we'll give them what they want, whether it's false or whether it's true, we'll fill our churches. But let us look further into this basket of fruit. Let us see just how rotten it is. We remember the Lord as he was going about and he was calling the disciples. And he was going about his father's business. And often he would be hunted and chased and he would go away into the back of the mountains to be alone. Sometimes we have to leave the throng of the day. Sometimes, like the Lord, we have to get away from the troubles and we have to go into a place of safety and pray. A time of prayer, as James was teaching us, be faithful in our prayer could stop the rain for three and a half years, could bring it again in a moment of a prayer, but faithful prayer. Let the Lord Jesus Christ, when he prayed, how faithful was his praise. Remember, he prayed at the feeding of 5,000. He lifted his eyes to heaven and prayed, and the Father blessed, and he fed them with such a meager meal he fed 5,000. And how he prayed in the garden. But in John 17, we find that he prays for us before he leaves the upper room, before he goes to that garden of Gethsemane. We find the Lord in prayer and deep in prayer for us in a sat room away from the maddened crowd, away from the throng that were wanting to crucify him. He was there with his disciples, men of faith, and he was praying with them. And he prayed, Father, thine they were, but you gave them to me. And I pray for those 
not only those whom thou hast given me, but those who are not of my flock. Remember, he prayed for others. He prayed for them. Are we in such a time of prayer this morning? So this basket of fruit, it's stinking. It's not a basket of fruit you want to give to anyone. It's a basket of fruit that has gone over, rail over. And this is how the Lord views his, his church in the Northern Ireland. How does the Lord view us today? How does the Lord look upon his church this morning? We gather in his name on his day. We are here to praise him. But how does the Lord look throughout his church? Not just a faithful few, but in church throughout the nations. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember his prayer on the cross of Calvary. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. What a prayer that was for us. But it wasn't just a prayer for those who stood round the cross. It wasn't just for a prayer for those who took him in to the place of judgment and beat him, spat on him, put a robe on him, put thorns on his head in the shape of a crown. It wasn't just a prayer for them or for those who took him from the Garden of Gethsemane and took him unto it. No, the Lord was praying. And John and his apostles, Gospel tells us in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting. Christ's prayer on the cross was for the whole world, the past world, the world in which we live, the world in yet it is unborn, a world that will hear the word of God or not hear it depending on how faithful we are today, how that basket of fruit can be turned round from being stinking rotten to be pleasant and acceptable unto all men. How can we turn that basket of fruit on end? How? The Lord was angry mightily angry with them. His anger was so great that he threatened to leave them and not pass by them again. He threatened to leave them on their own, to their own devices. For our Lord Jesus Christ, he came and made amends for us. He gave his life for us. He took that basket of fruit and he took 12 men and called them and sent them forth into this world to preach the gospel. That basket of fruit of Amos is beginning, was beginning to be turned upside down. We've seen great and wondrous works when we read our history of the church. And we see how men fought and died for the word of God. But today we see the fruit basket has been filled again with the rotten fruit, the sour fruit, the fruit that tells all men they can do as they please, the fruit that tells all men you can come to church, you can disobey the Lord, you can be of the same sex, you can live without marriage. You can have children without marriage. And if you don't want the child, you can abort it. Is that the basket of fruit that we are offering to our people today? The basket of fruit that the Lord Jesus Christ came to rescue, to restore, to bring again the power of the gospel and the obedience unto his Father's word.
we have a lot to be thankful for with our Lord, that he did come. He did pay that price on Calvary. He did give us a remedy in his blood for the remission of our sins. He did bring us back into fellowship with his Father. He did become the Lord God of our salvation. As Thomas could see the prince and he could say, my Lord and my God, when we are, see the blood of Christ in the gospel and if we receive Christ, then he becomes our Lord and our God. But are we maintaining that faithfulness? Do we tremble at the majesty of God? Do we tremble when we think how great God is who could create the earth from nothing, could create man from the dust of the earth, could create all things that man had need of. When we look at that basket of fruits, as individuals, what do we see? What do we see individually? Well, when I like to look at that basket of fruit, I like to see hope. Hope that men will respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hope that men will realize they can do nothing without Christ. Hope that men will realize that they, they share the gospel and that gospel is not tampered with. It's not abused. It's not corrupted. But it is the pure gospel of the crucified Jesus. It's the gospel that took our Lord to Calvary and into that borrowed tomb. My hope when I see that basket of fruit is one of revival, one of refreshing. As, a, as the prophet prayed for the rain to return, we should hope for a fruit to be bright, to be exciting, to draw men unto it, to bring us unto Christ. And like Peter, come with bitter tears, come crying, because we have failed. What do we see in that basket of fruit? There is hope. But there's also faith, isn't there? There's also faith that the Lord God will revive the fruit. The Lord will bring again a time of revival. That the Lord will bring again a mighty season in our land. That there will be a time of great mercy in our nation, when God will come in all power of the Holy Spirit and his mercy will be bright. Remember Habakkuk and how he prayed for that. And he said, Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. That's faith. Asking our Lord and faith to remember us, to revive us. His wrath must be very great when he looks at the church as it was when he sent Habakkuk to the fourth, to the ten tribes in the northern Israel. How he must have been very angry to threaten to remove himself from them and never pass by them again. Oh, how his mercy was shown at Calvary. The faith that we have in Christ coming again. It's that faith that helps us to pick that proper and correct fruit and place it in the Lord's basket. 
It is that faith that when the men stood and watched were Lord taken up into heaven, that the two men that appeared unto them said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up? This same Jesus I've seen taken up will come again in like manner. That faith, the faith that Christ is coming again, that faith should take us and make us work for the glory of God, that all men should have a share in that faith, that we will see Christ come again. We will be raised from the dust of the earth or from the depth of the sea, and those that remain will see him in his glory coming again. That's the faith. It's in that basket of fruit. That's the faith along with that great time of mercy that the Lord will give us in revival. And the hope, the hope of all of us should be the resurrection of the church. Our hope should be built in nothing less than Jesus Christ. Oh, let us build our hope on Christ. The first thing, the third thing that I see in that basket of fruit, although we have been Faith, hope, and charity. It's not just charity I see. I see forgiveness. I see forgiveness. The Lord forgiven us for our selfishness, our greed. The Lord forgiven us because we have sinned and come short of the glory of his Father. Forgiveness, it's all right having hope <coughs> and faith, but without forgiveness, they are nothing. Without the forgiveness of the Lord, we can do nothing. We have to get rid of this old garment, as I cause, as Isaiah tells us, our righteousness as a filthy rag. We have to put on the righteousness of Christ. And that's only put applied to us when Christ forgives us, when he washes us from our sins, when he gets us to stand and he can say, Father, they are mine. I have washed them. I have cleansed them. I have clothed them in my righteousness. Forgiveness, the third thing in our basket of fruit. Have we and do we know that forgiveness? Well, that's a forgiveness. And only through that forgiveness will we see the glory of God in the glory of heaven. Without that, like that rotten basket of fruit, we are fodder for the fire of hell. Without that faith, without that hope, without that salvation. And the fourth and final thing, commitment. Commitment. Oh, it's okay having hope and faith and forgiveness. But what about the commitment? What about the commitment to follow the Lord? No matter what. No matter where it leads us. We read from James' epistle. And yet James would suffer martyrdom. The first to suffer martyrdom as a disciple. Are we committed to follow Christ? Are we committed to stand by what we call our hope and our faith? Are we committed to stand by the gift of salvation 
in Christ, committed to put it aside, committed to see that all things are right and real, that all fruit is pleasant and worthy to offer unto our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruits of the earth and have long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. Our early and latter rain. The greatness of our forgiveness in Christ. The greatness of our Commitment will bring us that latter rain when Christ acknowledges us before his Father. That great and latter rain, it's there, James 5, 7, we can read it. Are we gathering precious fruits of the earth? Are we bringing them into the basket a basket that can present unto our Lord and our God. <coughs> Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the air of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Commitment. The four fruits I would like to see in the basket. The four fruits I'd like to see as fresh fruits, precious fruits in each and every man, each and every woman, each and every child being laden with these fruits. There's hope. Hope for all the world in the preaching of the gospel. There is faith that the Lord God will work in the hearts of men and women. There is salvation in the blood of Christ to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then there's our commitment, our commitment. What we ask for, the first three fruits, are we committed at carrying them being the burden bearer as Amos was, being the prophet that he went from looking after his father's flock to going unto the flock of God and reminding them of their trespasses and sins, reminding them how great their God was compared to the Syrian gods, reminding them that Jesus Christ died for their sins. That's James, his epistle. That's the apostles who established the church throughout the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, and lo, I am with you always, was their commitment and command. Is it ours? Are we committed? in our hearts? Are we committed to gathering the fruits, the precious fruits? The fruits that become the jewels in that great and terrible day when the Lord comes and gathers his jewels. Will we have a basket to offer? Will we have fruits to offer? And ye shall know them by their fruits. That's the gospel. That was Amos, a shepherd, given a vision. When we look out round about us throughout the world, no matter what church we're in, what are we looking at? The same vision as Amos or the prophet, prophecy of James. Let him know that he which converts a sinner from the error of his ways 
shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Hide in that sins in the blood of Christ. Are we committed? I'd like to see that basket of fruit overflowing to the glory of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for these two great servants, Amos and James. We thank thee that their words that thou had given to them have come down to us today, that we may learn, O Lord, from them, and we may set our hearts and gather in fruits that are worthy of acceptance before thy throne. So hear our prayers, Father. We ask thee now to help us and to prepare us for what the world hath outside, that we may be able to distinguish the good fruit from the bad fruit and may be able to fill our baskets with the precious fruit of the land. For we ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. In Psalm 89, we will sing from verse 15 to verse 18. Psalm 89, 15 to 18. O oh, greatly blessed the people are, the joyful sound that know. In brightness of the face, O Lord, the ever on shall go. Then thy name shall all the day rejoice exceedingly, and in thy righteousness shall they, exalted, be on high. Psalm 89, verses 15 to 18.
let's receive the Lord's blessing. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Ghost go with each of us to this day. Amen. <laughs>